In the shadowy depths of the world's oceans, nuclear submarines have played a pivotal role in military strategy and scientific exploration. Yet their powerful presence comes with inherent risks, as evidenced by a series of harrowing incidents that have unfolded over the years. From the infamous disappearance of the US Scorpion to the haunting fates of Soviet Arctic vessels, each incident serves as a stark reminder of the potential nuclear disaster that's existed in our recent maritime history. As we unravel these tales of tragedy and mystery, we'll uncover the legacy of these underwater nuclear behemoths and the profound impact they've left on our ocean floors and the Earth at large. USS Thresher The USS Thresher, designed to counter Soviet submarines during the Cold War era, was renowned for its speed and stealth capabilities, being one of the fastest and quietest submarines of its time. It boasted advanced weaponry, including launchers for the Subrock anti-submarine missile, as well as cutting-edge sonar systems for unprecedented detection ranges. This submarine handled trials and evaluations, including participation in exercises and tests of the Subrock missile system. However, it encountered further setbacks, including damage from a collision with a tugboat in Port Canaveral, Florida. Following repairs and a prolonged availability period, Thresher was finally recertified in April 1963. On April 9th of that year, the USS Thresher, led by Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, departed from Kittery, Maine, for its post-overhaul dive trials. After meeting with the submarine rescue ship, Skylark, Thresher began its dive tests about 190 nautical miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. During the tests, Thresher experienced communication issues and reported minor difficulties before suddenly losing contact. The Navy initiated a search operation involving 15 ships, and by the evening of April 10th, it was confirmed that Thresher was missing, leading to a public announcement of its loss by Admiral George W. Anderson. Junior President John F. Kennedy ordered flags to be flown at half-staff in honor of the 129 lost Samaritans and shipyard personnel. The Navy launched an extensive search operation, deploying surface ships and utilizing support from the Naval Research Laboratory. The NRL's vessel Rockville, equipped with advanced sonar, was sent to search for Thresher's wreckage. Other ships conducted sonar searches and investigations of potential debris sites. The Bathyscaphe Trieste was also deployed for dives into the debris field, though initial attempts were hindered by equipment issues. Eventually the wreck was located and with parts successfully recovered in September 1964. Investigations into the sinking of the USS Thresher revealed a probable failure in a salt water piping system joint, which heavily relied on silver brazing instead of welding. Earlier tests had identified potential issues with some of these joints, but most were deemed not serious enough to require immediate repair. Another contributing factor to the disaster was the inability to blow the ballast tanks due to moisture freezing inside the submarine's high-pressure air flasks. This hindered the emergency blow system's operation, which could have helped surface the submarine. The US Navy has periodically monitored the environmental conditions of the Thresher's site since its sinking, ensuring that there is no significant environmental impact from the nuclear reactor on board. Reports on environmental monitoring confirm that the nuclear fuel remains intact and there has been no significant effect on the deep ocean environment. While some information regarding the Thresher disaster has been declassified, much of the Court of Inquiry's records remain unavailable to the public. Efforts to release these documents have been ongoing with a federal court ordering the Navy to begin releasing them in response to a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. Soviet K-219 The Soviet submarine K-219, part of the Navaga-class ballistic missile submarines, experienced a harrowing incident during the height of the Cold War on October 3, 1986. This submarine carried 16 R-27U liquid-fuel missiles, powered by a combination of UDMH and NTO. These highly volatile materials were key components of the missile propulsion system. At around 5.30 a.m. Moscow time, a crisis unfolded when seawater began leaking into one of the missile silos, specifically Silo 6. This seemingly innocuous leak turned catastrophic when it mixed with the missile fuel, 
triggering a violent chemical reaction. The reaction generated chlorine and nitrogen dioxide gases and intense heat. This heat further decomposed fuming nitric acid, producing even more toxic gases. In a desperate attempt to mitigate the situation, the submarine's weapons officer, Alexander Petrachkov, took action. He disengaged the hatch cover and attempted to vent the missile tube to the sea, but unfortunately, his efforts were in vain. Shortly after 5.32 a.m., an explosion ripped through Silo 6, causing extensive damage and claiming the lives of two sailors instantly. A third sailor succumbed to toxic gas poisoning soon after. The blast created a breach in the submarine's hull, leading to rapid flooding. K-219, originally cruising at a depth of 40 meters beneath the surface, swiftly descended to depths exceeding 300 meters. Amidst the chaos, the crew exhibited extraordinary courage and resolve. Despite the perilous conditions, some sailors remained trapped in a sealed section of the submarine. After a conference with incident specialists, the captain made the decision to open the hatch and save the lives of 25 sailors. However, challenges persisted as the nuclear reactor failed to shut down automatically as designed. Lieutenant Nikolai Belikov, one of the reactor control officers, entered the reactor compartment to address the malfunction. Tragically, he ran out of oxygen after managing to manipulate only one of the four rod assemblies. In a selfless act of heroism, 20-year-old enlisted seaman Sergei Premenin volunteered to shut down the reactor, guided by the chief engineer's instructions. Despite the perilous conditions and the presence of a raging fire within the compartment, Premenin succeeded in his task. However, his attempts to reach his comrades on the other side of a door were thwarted by the pressure difference, leading to his death from asphyxiation. With the reactor now safely shut down and the submarine stabilized, Captain Britnov made the difficult decision to surface K-219 using battery power alone. Efforts to tow the damaged vessel back to port proved futile due to additional complications and poison gas leaks. As a last resort, the crew evacuated onto a towing ship, while Britnov remained aboard. Despite efforts to salvage the submarine, the situation deteriorated rapidly. Ultimately, K-219 sank to the bottom of the Hatteras Abyssal Plain on October 6, 1986, with its full complement of nuclear weapons lost along with the vessel. The aftermath saw Premenin posthumously honoured for his bravery, while Captain Britnov faced serious charges. However, with shifts in Soviet leadership, including the dismissal of Defence Minister Sergei Sokolov, Britnov's charges were ultimately dropped, and the vessel remains on the ocean floor to this very day. The USS Scorpion The USS Scorpion, a N-Skipjack-class nuclear-powered submarine, served in the US Navy from 1960 to 1968, stationed primarily in Norfolk, Virginia, and specializing in nuclear submarine warfare tactics. Despite commendations for its operations and reports of venturing into Soviet territory in 1966, it underwent a limited refueling overhaul in 1967, neglecting crucial safety upgrades. Deployed to the Mediterranean in 1968, it faced mechanical issues but continued its mission, including providing cover for other submarines and observing Soviet naval activities. In May 1968, the US Scorpion attempted to transmit messages but could only reach a Greek communication station instead of its intended destination at Naval Station Rota. The last message received from Commander Slattery indicated the submarine's intent to surveil a Soviet submarine and research group. However, Scorpion failed to arrive at its Norfolk home port as scheduled on May 27th, triggering concern. A large-scale search involving numerous ships and aircraft commenced, with hopes of locating the missing vessel and its crew. During this period, a cryptic radio message, including Scorpion's codename Brandywine, was received by search parties, further adding to the mystery. Despite extensive search efforts, Scorpion and its crew were declared lost on June 5th, with the submarine's name later removed from the Naval Vessel Register on June 30th. The search continued with the deployment of specialized teams, including mathematical consultants led by John Pina Craven, who utilized Bayesian search theory to narrow down potential search areas. This methodology, previously used in locating lost objects, such as a hydrogen bomb off the coast of Palomari, Spain, proved instrumental in guiding the search efforts. 
In late October 1968, sections of Scorpion's hull were discovered on the seabed, approximately 400 nautical miles southwest of the Azores, submerged under nearly 10,000 feet of water. This discovery followed the release of sound tapes from the Navy's underwater SOSUS listening system, which contained recordings of the submarine's destruction. Photographs and eyewitness accounts obtained during subsequent investigations painted a clearer picture of Scorpion's demise. Evidence suggested that the submarine experienced implosion forces as it sank below its safe operating depth, causing catastrophic structural damage. The torpedo room, although pinched by extreme sea pressure, remained relatively intact compared to the operations compartment, which collapsed first. The sail was torn off and the propulsion shaft detached as the submarine descended further into the depths, ultimately falling an additional 9,000 feet to the ocean floor. Additional photographs taken in 1986 provided further insight into the extent of the damage, confirming the severity of the structural collapse experienced by the vessel. Following this tragic sinking, the United States Navy undertook extensive investigations to unravel the mystery surrounding the disaster. A court of inquiry, headed by Vice Admiral Bernard L. Austin, was swiftly convened to scrutinize the incident and produce a report detailing potential causes. While the inquiry ruled out sabotage, it stopped short of definitively identifying the reason for the loss, citing insufficient evidence. This left lingering questions about what precisely led to the submarine's demise. In 1984, revelations emerged from leaked documents obtained by the Norfolk Virginian pilot and the Ledger Star, suggesting a scenario where a torpedo explosion occurred during disarmament efforts by Scorpion's crew. This revelation added another layer of complexity to the ongoing investigation, prompting renewed interest and scrutiny into the tragedy. Further insights were offered in a 1970 report from the Naval Ordnance Laboratory, which conducted an exhaustive analysis of hydroacoustic signals related to the submarine sinking. This study, led by a variety of experts, proposed that the hull of the Scorpion may have failed at a depth of 2,000 feet, resulting in fragmentation as it descended further into the abyss. Despite these conflicting theories, the physical remnants of US Scorpion lay undisturbed on the sandy seabed of the North Atlantic Ocean, approximately 400 nautical miles southwest of the Azores. The US Navy periodically revisits the site to assess any disturbances to the wreckage and to monitor for potential releases of fissile materials from the submarine's nuclear reactor or the two nuclear weapons it carried. Environmental surveys conducted around the wreck indicate minimal impact, with no significant radioactive contamination detected beyond the immediate vicinity of the sunken vessel. In November 2012, the US Submarine Veterans, a prominent organization with over 13,800 members, urged the US Navy to reopen the investigation into the sinking of US Scorpion. However, the Navy declined the request, prompting private groups, including families of the lost submariners, to contemplate conducting independent inquiries into the tragedy, given the wreck's location in international waters. Soviet Arctic Submarines While the previous submarines are known to populate the Atlantic Ocean floor, there have been a couple of Soviet submarine disasters that have filled the Arctic floor with similar nuclear footprints. The first of which was the K-27, the lone nuclear submarine of the Soviet's naval project 645. K-27, an experimental attack submarine, began its journey when its keel was laid down on June 15, 1958, at a local Soviet shipyard. After being launched on April 1, 1962, it entered service on October 30, 1963, and was officially commissioned into the Soviet Northern Fleet on September 7, 1965. Assigned to the 17th Submarine Division, K-27 embarked on test operations, despite ongoing issues with its nuclear reactors. Troubles arose on May 24, 1968, when one of K-27's reactors experienced a sudden drop in power output, leading to the release of radioactive gases into the engine room. Radiation levels spiked dangerously, reaching up to 1.5 grays per hour, primarily composed of gamma rays and thermal neutrons. 
However, inadequate training prevented the crew from recognizing extensive fuel element failures in the reactor. Despite attempts to repair the reactor at sea, nine crew members suffered fatal radioactive exposures. Following the incident, K-27 was laid up in 1968 onwards, undergoing various experimental projects until 1973. Plans to rebuild or replace the reactor were deemed too costly and impractical, given the emergence of more modern submarines in the Soviet Navy. Ultimately, K-27 was decommissioned in 1979, and its reactor compartment was sealed with a special mixture to prevent radioactive contamination. It was then scuttled in the eastern Kara Sea on September 6, 1982, contrary to international guidelines, at a depth of just 33 meters. Despite efforts to assess the environmental impact of the scuttling, concerns remain about potential radioactivity. Plans have been discussed to raise the submarine, with France offering specialized equipment for dismantling the nuclear reactors. However, challenges persist due to the fusion of nuclear rods with liquid metal coolant. The second submarine lost to the Arctic is the Soviet-turned-Russian K-159, a nuclear-powered vessel used by the Soviet Navy's Northern Fleet between 1963 and 1989. On March 2, 1965, K-159 encountered a significant accident involving radioactive discharges into her steam generators, likely due to leaks from the primary coolant tubes into the steam chest and turbines. Despite the contamination of her propulsion plant, K-159 continued operations for two more years before undergoing overhaul and replacement of her steam generators. K-159 was decommissioned in 1989 and laid up in Gremikau without defueling her reactors. With minimal maintenance over the following 14 years, the submarine's outer hull rusted extensively, weakening its integrity. In August 2003, K-159 supported by makeshift pontoons due to its deteriorated hull, was being towed to Poliani. However, during a squall on August 30th, one of the pontoons ripped away, causing K-159 to sink in the Barents Sea, 200 meters below the surface, with nine crew members and approximately 800 kilograms of spent nuclear fuel. Legal actions followed, including charges against the captain overseeing the towing operation. Plans to raise the wreck were considered with Russian President Vladimir Putin issuing a draft decree in March 2020 for an initiative to lift both K-159 and K-27, along with four reactor compartments from the Barents Sea. However, the recovery cost is estimated to be around $330 million in USD. Legal actions ensued with widows of deceased submariners filing lawsuits against the Russian Defense Ministry for compensation while recovery planning and salvage operations were explored by various entities, including the British Ministry of Defense. The sinking resulted in the loss of nine crew members, with only two bodies recovered immediately, and one crew member rescued alive. The remaining seven crew members were presumed trapped in the wreck. Their remains still at the ocean floor, along with the nuclear vessels of yesteryear, where they will probably remain to the end of time. We hope you found this video fascinating and we'll be sure to see you next week for another maritime themed video.